Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. This is going to be a very different kind of video. I'm only going to be going through one book today. Usually I do at least three, but um, this is a pre-Kickstarter edition of a of this book, Dawn of the Orcs. It's a dark, GM-less role-playing game. Dark fantasy. And I don't usually do dark fantasy, but this one caught my eye. Um, now this is by Lime and Plasmophage, and Lime reached out to me and said, hey, we're doing the Kickstarter. Uh, would you be willing to look through this book and just put it out there if it's interesting to you and see if you like it? So I was given a copy of this, and, and a physical copy as well was sent to me. So thank you to Lime for that. Uh, and I wanted to go through it and just give you guys a, a sense of what this book is. Essentially, it is a weird, <laughs> dark fantasy, GM-less role-playing game. That's how this works. Now, the way I think of it is it's just it's a world-building game. This is a world-building game. It's essentially uh, the idea, the, the elevator pitch that Lime gave me was Dr. Strangelove, but every character is Saruman. And that's a great intro. The idea here is that there is this kingdom that's relatively peaceful, and suddenly it's invaded, and a council of sages is called together, and those are the players, and they have to create the orcs. Basically, they have to create a race of creatures that it will fight back against the invasion. So, as you can imagine, you have to make these sort of choices about what the orcs are like at the beginning. And as the game goes on, more and more choices are made, and the orcs start to maybe get a little rebellious, or maybe they start to get a little bit too aggressive, or maybe they start to lose, you start to lose control of them, and at some point, things go haywire. And so, rather than this sort of being like a regular role-playing game, although there's, there is role-playing and there is sort of uh, world-building and discussion and, and storytelling, I should say, it's, it's primarily a world-building game. I think this would be a great game to start off a campaign with. Like, you play this to a point, and then you say, okay, now we're going to make characters in the world that we've just generated. Um, now, there's a sort of a pre-assumed setting, and a lot of the, the names and, and things are already put in, but you could replace them with the world of your choice. So I'll go through I'll go through this. It's 55 pages, this pre-Kickstarter version. And uh, I'll just go through a few of these pages and give you just a sense of what it is and what it looks like. And the art is great throughout, really, really good. Um, a game and words by Lime, visual design and interior art by Plasmophage. Uh, and then a few additional artists. I just think this is a great edition, a great book, I should say. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty short, as you see, uh, 55 pages in uh, this form. But a lot of those pages are sort of extra pages, bonus things. And a great piece of art there. I love that. Uh, what you're going to need to play it. You need a D6, some ten, a ten-sided dice, um, 90 to 120 minutes to play the whole thing, and one to eight players. So you can play it certainly solo, but it's really designed to be kind of a world-building uh, world building game. You go around and, and you pass the book between people if you have a physical edition or you just open the PDF. And, and then each player gets to be a chronicler. They record what's happening. Um, and then people get to be narrator. And, and you could develop this more than what's laid out here. In, in other words, you could, as you'll see, there's, there's prompts that are sort of, this is what happens in this chapter, this is what happens in this next chapter. But it's really just the basics. You could develop and tell the whole story with the people at the table if you wanted. So you could make this go a lot longer than the 90 to 120 minutes, I think, if you wanted to really dive into each of these chapters and moments in the creation of the orcs and their first wars, uh, which is really, really cool. Um, a great piece of art there. So it's more science fantasy. Um, so chapter one, skies of smoke and flame. The kingdom of Lania has lived in peace for a thousand years. The people of Lania do not know the ways of war and have no stomach for violence. The conquering armies of the Styrovites now rampage across Lania with none to stop them, putting all to the sword and the torch. You are the council of sages that has been assembled to create, through ancient sorcery and reckless science, soldiers able to stand against the Styrovites. Inspired by myths of a spirit called Orcus who killed the wicked, you have chosen to name your creation Orcs. And then you have Who Are You? <laughs> I love the art there, too. The guy with the fishbowl head is my favorite. But you can come up with your own sages, but here are some inspirations. And that's one thing that this book, I think, is, is excellent for. Even if you don't intend to use it as a world-building book, you could certainly use this as just a source of inspiration for your world. How things change, how particular, how the orcs in your world are different than the orcs elsewhere. Make your orcs special. This would be a great place to do it. But there's also a lot of some tables for 
for inspiration and stuff like that. So here's one, right? You could be the self-appointed general to the guild, or the reclusive physician ex mortis, or the court witch of the West, the honorary wizard at arms, right? You generate your, uh, your name here, and that's, that's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, and then you have your motivation. And now it says there are two extra rules here. One is disagreement, and this is, you know, what happens if the Council of Sages chooses this or that, and they can't agree. Well, then um, put it to a vote, and the narrator breaks ties, if there is a tie. And then there's this thing called betrayal, and once per game, each sage can betray the Council. So after we, after somebody chooses an option, the sage says, hey, I betray, our, I betray the Council, and I switch choices. And you switch to a different option. And you'll see that there are choices throughout the game that make some pretty big impacts. And so you can really send things going in a different direction if you want. But you only do it once per game. Otherwise, you have to rely on the consensus or the vote. So that's kind of an interesting element to the game, too. Is it's, it's not competitive, but there is a moment at which things do become sort of this side versus that side, or they can. They don't have to and the sages can can split. And so this betrayal could be interesting if you wanted, for example, to play to your motivation. One of those motivations is so, so chaos, discord, and havoc, you could betray at the right time to make things go the wrong way for the orcs and make them go crazy or something like that. So that's chapter one is just the sages. Chapter two is creation. And, uh, and you have to basically choose one of a set of things that the orcs you know, come from. So when first devised by the council, the orcs are nothing more or less than people made for war and able to kill without hesitation or regret. The council has come up with a way to create them and perhaps a way to control them. So orcs start with these scores. Numbers, zero, loyalty, zero, brute, zero, and clever, zero. They are on the same size as an average Lanian human. Essentially, uh, as you go through the game, they have four stats and size. And those stats are going to go up and down. And at the end of the game, depending on their numbers, well, and throughout the game, their numbers will affect what dice rolls, what modifiers are added to dice rolls. But at the end of the game, if the certain numbers, um, basically the, the end of the story depends on the numbers. So not just numbers, but I mean on what numbers is, what loyalty is, what brute is, and what clever is, and, and which one's highest, which one's lowest, and the combinations and things like that. So you need to pay attention to those, and that's really what you're playing to adjust throughout the game. You're playing to adjust their the, these four scores. And so, again, depending on your background, depending on what you want, and depending on the kind of ending you might want, right? You might want loyalty down. If, you, if, you're, if your goal is to sow discord, for example, then maybe you're loyal, you want their loyalty to be low. You want their brute to be high, their numbers to be high, or something like that, right? Um, but if you're more interested in showing the power of your creation to the world, maybe you want loyalty and cleverness high or loyalty and brute high, right? Like, so you're, you're trying to manipulate these numbers and trying to get the, the sage, the council of sages to pick the right one. And so the thing to do would be, of course, I think, to have the council of sages be role-playing the whole time rather than think of this as like a game and be like, okay, what do we want to do to get the next chapter in the game, guys? Role-play out each scene of the council, right? What are we to do here? What are we to do here? How are we to change things here? And so, you get some choices. Uh, what are the orcs? Are they forged whole from sorcery and raw materials? Well, then they get numbers plus one, and you have to decide what they're made of. If any Lanian can be turned into an orc through a ritual, then the orcs gain loyalty plus one. But how is the ritual done? And if only some Lanians can be turned into orcs, the orcs gain loyalty plus one and brute plus one, but numbers minus one. And the question is, what kind of Lanians can become an orc? So these are things that are part of the story. They're not mechanically... Um, they don't mechanically change anything, right? So what sort of Lanian can become an orc? That's a question for you to decide, the narrator to decide. Uh, and if there's a disagreement, you know, for people to vote on. It's not the sort of thing that is going to be a huge impact in the mechanics of the game. And so that's why I think this is seen, this should be seen more as a world-building, role-playing game rather than like a thing to beat. It's not a cooperative, hey, we're going to try to beat the game. Yes, you can lose in a way, <laughs> but not really. The ending is going to happen one way or the other, and then the, the ending can be sadder or, or happier, depending on what kind of happens and depending on what your goals are. But it isn't the same thing as like, okay, we lost, now we have to start again. That's not how the game works. It's, it, the narrative goes through the whole thing, and you're just making decisions as you go. So, for example, the next, that's the first one. The second one is if the orcs are bound, how are they bound in obedience? Are they bound in obedience to an item, record the nature of the item and how it is kept, and the orc gain plus three loyalty unless the item falls into the wrong hands. Now, that can come up in the story and outside the story, right? You could probably narrate that happening, but there is at some point a connection to um, the item 
uh, one of the choices later says, if you picked that, then that item falls into the wrong hand. So you can either make it part of the narrative and, and or the game actually mechanically draws it in sometimes. Uh, and so basically, again, are they bound to loyalty to a person? Who is that person? And then if that person dies without heirs, then you know, things go wrong. If the orcs are loyal to nothing, then they gate those numbers. Now, here's an interesting aspect to this game. Warps and shifts. And it's one thing I wanted to talk about before I go. I'm not going to go through the whole book. I don't want to go through every, every part of it, but I do want to go through uh, just a few more chapters just so you guys get a sense of what it's like. But warps and shifts are kind of interesting. Um, every chapter you will have a battle, some event that will happen and you have to roll based on the modifiers of those four scores that the orcs have, loyalty or brute. You can choose which one that they use and approach things differently. But in the aftermath of those battles, those challenges, um, the orcs will either have succeeded or failed in what they were set to do. And, and you as sages will have either succeeded or failed in what you have set to do. And if you've succeeded, then you'll get usually three warps is what it's called. And if you fail, you'll get two. And the idea here is it's developments or warps to the orcs' physiology, to their behavior, to their characteristics, etc. And so you're changing them. As the game goes on, the orcs are getting... They're just changing in various ways, and the warps are detailed after each chapter. There's different ones for each chapter. And you have to use all of them that you're given. So if you succeed, you get three, usually. If you fail, you get two. And you have to use them. So the orcs are going to be changing and developing sometimes degrade, devolving, sort of, sometimes evolving, sort of, as the game goes. So that's something that's, that can happen. Then there are shifts, and shifts are things that you can do, but you don't have to do. And you can do all of them or none of them, all four, but you can only do each one once per chapter. And some of them are reversed, so like it'll be get, make them bigger, make them smaller. You could do both, but then it would just you know, even out to zero. So there's really only two um, that you know flip. There, there's two sides to the two. Um, so, in other words, there are automatic changes that the orcs are going to do, and they're pretty dramatic. And then there's consistent changes you can do every chapter if you want, but they're up to you. And so if the orcs are starting to, you know, lose a lot of numbers or they're starting to lose a lot of, you know, something, you can start to use shifts to try to boost them up a little bit, but that's going to have effects on the story too. So warps are changes that have to happen. Shifts are changes that you can choose to have happen. Uh, no matter what occurs. And the shifts are the same for each chapter, but the warps are different. So I'll give you an example. So here's chapter three, the slaughter of Shrike Forest. In an act of desperation, the first few orcs are sent against an overwhelming Styravite force. The Styravites make camp in the gloomy depths of the Shrike Forest. The orcs strike at night, hoping surprise and shock will make up for their lack of numbers, arms, and experience. Pick any two scores to serve as a stratagem, but these scores can never be used together as a stratagem again. So this is the trick, right? So you can use cunning and, or you can use clever and brute or you could use numbers and loyalty, but you can never use that combination again. There's, there's enough chapters so that it works out, right? You have to use every combination. And then you roll D6 plus the stratagem numbers for this first one. And if the total is five or higher, then Lania is victorious. So for the first couple, it's gonna be plus zero, plus one, plus two, right? So you're, you're likely, but as it goes on, you get higher bonuses because your, your numbers, the orcs are gonna go up in these various abilities. Now, on the other hand, they, they might start going down. Um, and then you're going to be less and less successful. The orcs are less and less useful as a, as a force um, if the numbers are, are in the negative. Or at least if all of the numbers are in the negative, right? You're, you're less likely to be able to succeed there. But this is what I mean why it's, it's not really about winning or losing. Because even if the orcs lose every single time, the game isn't over. The story still continues. So... If you roll a d6 plus the stratagem and your total is five or higher, then you win. And on a victory, the orc ambush is terrifying and unexpected. Styravite soldiers break and flee in terror. The orcs run them down and the creeks of Shrike Forest run red with Styravite blood. Three, pick three warps. You know, the warps are on the next page. On a defeat, the orcs are too few and too new to war. They are easily outnumbered and methodically slain by the disciplined invaders. The Styravites will be ready for the next wave of orcs. They only pick two warps. Now, obviously, the, the warps are mechanical, but the story here is also important. That if, if the orcs win, then the story is going to be going in a different direction because the Styravites are terrified of them than if they beat them, and it's, it's, not as, it's not as impressive. Now, here's another thing, too, at the bottom is if any of the score reaches minus eight, minus four, four, or eight in this chapter, and this is true for every chapter, list one new custom the orcs have begun that sets them apart from the Lanians. And so, again, you develop the orcs as a sort of race in the world as these scores go up and down. If they reach four or minus four, eight or minus eight, then they get a new custom over the course of the chapter. 
And that, again, is, is, is why I think of this as a world-building game. So you, you, you play this whole game and you develop the race of orcs and then, boom, you put them in your world and now you have this very interesting, well-developed, collaboratively built race that isn't just typical orcs. And you'll see the warps make them very interesting. So here are the warps. And again, if you succeed, you have to pick three of these. If you fail, you pick two. So here's what they are, right? Orcs can fly into a battle rage and they get plus one brute. Or orcs have natural weapons. Describe them. Plus one brute. Orcs are hard to kill. Plus one numbers. Orcs can march without tiring and survive off scraps and forge. They'll make a lion sick. Plus one numbers. And orcs can see by night. Plus one clever. So you can choose which of these five to give them. And again, you have to give them three if you win and you have to give them two if you fail. And then there are the shifts, right? Make the orcs larger, which means they have plus one brute, minus one numbers. Make the orcs smaller, minus one brute, plus one numbers. You can indoctrinate the orcs, which is plus one loyalty, minus one clever, or educate the orcs, minus one loyalty, plus one clever. And there they get more beliefs or skills. If you indoctrinate them, they get more beliefs. If you educate them, they get more skills. So this is really interesting, right? Again, you're developing this particular race of creatures as you go through. And then essentially you just have more of these chapters. Here's the rescue at Sinasef. Styrovite cavalry, car cavalry carries off the royal family of Lanian. The orcs have one chance to head them off at the small village of Sinasef and rescue the royals. And then again, you pick any two, and you have to roll. This is on a total of five or higher, Lanian is victorious. On a victory, enough orcs are in the area to surround the Styrovites. After a tense standoff, the royals are rescued unharmed. From now on, the Council of Sages has the backing of the crown no matter what they do. Pick three warps. On a defeat, orcs rescue, the orc rescuers arrive with little time to spare. After a tense standoff, the Styrovites panic and the royals are slain. The remaining line of succession is murky. Multiple claimants fight for the throne of Lanyan, even as the country burns. Pick two warps. And if the orcs were bound in supernatural loyalty to a member of the monarchy, minus two loyalty. So if that's who you picked, right, when you said, hey, the orcs were supernaturally bound to someone, and if someone said, oh, it would make sense, it's the ruler of the land or the king or the son of the king or the queen or whatever it is, uh-oh, now you've just lost two loyalty. Right, so that's... It's one of those things where once you've played it, you might not pick that, obviously, because you're like, oh, we don't want that to happen. Um, so really, once you play through this game, the basic chapters are kind of checked off. Now, the game also has a whole bunch of bonus chapters in the end that you can use to substitute in each of these individual chapters if you want to replay the game with the same group of people. So that's really cool. So it's, it has, has replay value. It's not just one playthrough. And once again, you have the warps here, right? Orcs are taught the sorcery they needed to create more orcs, plus two numbers, minus one loyalty. Orcs can have children with each other. At, some, uh, at least some grow into adult warriors at incredibly fast speed, plus one numbers. Orcs can have children with each other. At least some grow and mature at the same speed of Lanians, plus one brute. Orcs and Lanians can have half-orc children, plus one loyalty. Orcs begin to crave the flesh of their enemies, plus one brute. So anyway, the, the, the rest of this book is essentially more of these chapters going on and on like this. I really quickly want to jump to the end, the appendices, uh, because you get some extra, um, uh, yeah, you get some extra pages at the end. Dawn of the Orcs, the Orc Chronicle, chapter one, you get the little box for who the Chronicler is and who the Sages are, and there's just, you, know, you can recreate them every time. The Chronicler can either be the same person or it can be multiple people, and you can describe them, of course, in these boxes down here. Um, you have more Sages. And then you have for each chapter, right, you have how are they created, how are they controlled, and then you have their stats. Uh, brute, clever numbers and loyalty and new customs that they have over the course of the game. And then, you know, chapter three, what is the stratagems that they get? What are the events that occur to them? The warps that they have, the shifts that they have. And what are their chap stats at the end of this? Their customs, beliefs and skills and their size. <laughs> Green goo all the way up to giants. And they start at the Lanian size. And then chapter four, chapter five, chapter six. So you have different pages for each of these if you want to fill these in as you play. So I think this is a really, really cool game, and I'm really happy that Lime reached out and asked if I would check it, because this is the sort of game I love. I love world-building games that aren't super long. Um, games like Kingdom or Microscope or Lineage. Dawn of the Orcs is right in there for me. I love those games, and this is, this is exactly the right sort of thing. So um, this is going, I think, up today on Kickstarter. I highly recommend you guys check this out. Um, this is just a fantastic game. I think, just even if you just get the PDF, that'd be great, but a physical copy, I have a physical copy, and it's great. You can flip through it. Um, the art is excellent. It's a nice little splat book that um, is well-constructed. If this is the actual quality of the Kickstarter book, and I know you guys can't see it. I'm holding it in my hand right now. But um, it's really, really good. And uh, as you guys can see from this, it's a great idea. So anyway, 
I'll put a link below if this is uh, if it's all up and running. I'll put a link below to the Kickstarter. Um, but you guys can search for the Kickstarter and uh, check it out and uh, and see if it's if it's what you'd like. All right. Well, that's it for this video. See you guys in another one.